تفضل يا بونا yes uh, well thank you so much بونا تايتس uh, for joining us uh, all the way from Memphis I know it's a long distance and uh, transportation is tough and everything but glad uh, to have uh, your reverence with us uh, uh we'll pick up we'll, we'll pick up the transportation uh bill if that's okay <laughs> we miss you Amuna, and uh, it's an amazing opportunity to have your reverence with us tonight thank you Abby. absolve me my father uh, from your mouth father in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit one god amen uh this this meeting is uh, is very dear to my heart um, and Abuna is the, is the first one who has encouraged me in the beginning to give a talk in the in the in the ark meeting, and uh, it has a special place in my heart. Um, and God knows how much I want to be with you in person, uh, but very thankful for the technology that enables us to connect nonetheless. <laughs> um, It's, it's uh, yani, if, if I can say, um, Abuna's choice of the topic couldn't have been more divine. Um, just because God has put it on my heart uh, recently to dig a little bit deeper into apologetics. Um, and let me tell you, Annie, something interesting. Growing up, I always uh, thought apologetics and evangelism is really something that's not for me. Uh, on this, Yanni, born... Coptic Orthodox guy that yani, thinks or doesn't really think of evangelism and, and apologetics. And I thought it's not my talent. Uh, and, and I still don't think it's my talent, but may God complement my deficiency. Um, little did I know how much uh, God really spoke through many people uh, to me and, and finally on, on Abuna Krollos's heart to just uh, ask me to speak about apologetics. Um, tonight's topic is more of, of an introduction. It is, um, we have thought of calling it unveiling the blind faith. Uh, and basically the intent behind this topic is to sort of lay a foundation of what is apologetics do we need apologetics and and um, and how do we do apologetics um once we lay that foundation then maybe with god's grace we can we can dig a little bit deeper into um specific topics so this topic is basically meant to uh sort of whet your appetite for an in-depth apologetics discussions later on is truth absolute? Does God exist? Creation versus evolution, the problem of pain, evil, the case for the resurrection, authenticity of the Bible, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of things that we can dig deeper into uh, later on, but this is basically just to lay a foundation of apologetics. Um, so with God's grace, and maybe I can I can share a presentation that will help us um, just focus um, together. Is it working, Father? Very good. Um, so with God's grace, here is what, uh, what we're going to cover. What is the word apologetics? What's the, what's the correlation between apologetics and evangelism? Why do we need apologetics if we need apologetics? Um, is there a biblical mandate for apologetics? Uh, and finally, what is the art of doing apologetics? Uh, does anyone know what the word apologetics comes from? 
and this is this is the part where I wish I was with you in person. Um, but basically, um, the word apologetics comes or is derived from the Greek word apologia or apologia, uh, which basically means to give a defense using reasoned arguments for a theory or a belief that you hold. So basically, it's whether it's a written defense or a verbal defense of your uh, position. And apologetics is a branch of theology that deals with defending the faith um, with logic, as I said, and reasoned arguments. Um, let me give you something that's more tangible. Um, Ravi Zacharias, who's, who's one of the greatest uh, apologists of this, of this age, um, basically has a slogan or a mantra for his ministry that, that I think, in my opinion, um, defines apologetics in a very elegant way. Uh, it's basically helping believers think and thinkers believe. So what, what does that mean? If you are a believer, then it helps you develop that critical thinking and that reasoning that in fact strengthens your faith more. And if you are a thinker and you're not yet a believer, apologetics will give you all the, it will arm you with the evidence for you to adopt the faith or to believe. So it's, it helps believers think and thinkers believe. Um, it is speaking in defense. So do we see any of, of apologetics in the Bible? Absolutely. Here is, this is a picture of St. Paul giving an apologia in front of Festus and King Agrippa, right? And at the end of this, King Agrippa looks at Paul and says, you almost convinced me to become a Christian, right? Here is another one in Acts 7, St. Stephen uh, is, is uh, being questioned in front of the Sanhedrin, and he is giving an, an apologia, starting with the Old Testament all the way to Christ and how Christ fulfills the, uh, the prophecies. And, and he gives evidence for the risen Lord Jesus Christ. What is the aim of apologetics? Um, I'm trying to go a little bit quicker so I can leave some time for questions and hopefully we can, we can see um, some questions at the end. The aim and the primary purpose of apologetics is to remove all roadblocks and stumbling blocks from the path of a person who is genuinely pursuing the ultimate truth, right? Very often you will have uh, almost a circular argument and, 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 and never ending, a bottomless pit of a discussion with somebody who is not willing to, um, who is not willing to pursue the truth or they have other uh, drivers that are blocking them from God. But a person who's genuinely pursuing the truth, the aim of apologetics is to remove all their doubts and their, and their questions, right? Um, for them to be able to uh, encounter the Lord Christ in their life and find the truth. Because Christ said, I am the way, the truth. So the truth is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ravi Zacharias gives a very nice um, uh, testimony. And he says at the age of 17, he um, attempted suicide. And when he was uh, on the hospital bed, um, after that attempting suicide, a complete stranger passes by his hospital bed and hands over a Bible to him. And uh, 
and he was too weakened to read from the Bible. So his mother opened the Bible and she opened um, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 14, the specific verse that says, because I live, you will also live. And that resonated with him so much that um, from that moment on, he vowed to pursue truth. And his exact words were, I shall not leave no stones unturned until, until I find the absolute truth. So those who are pursuing truth wholeheartedly, apologetics basically paves the way for them to find the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. What, what, is the, um, what is the correlation or the difference between apologetics and evangelism? Apologetics is actually called pre-evangelism, right? The academic term for apologetics is pre-evangelism. And why do we say that? Because basically there are two distinct apolog uh, theological disciplines, Christian disciplines, and apologetics precedes evangelism, right? Think of it basically in a way that you're removing the weeds before seeding. Apologetics in the heart of an unbeliever or in the heart of somebody who took the faith blindly and doesn't know what they believe and why they believe what they believe. Apologetics is basically taking the weeds out and tilling the ground for the seeds of the word of God to fall on their hearts and bring forth fruit 30, 60, and 100. So apologetics is pre-evangelism. And when you think about it, when you evangelize about salvation and the cross and the kingdom of heaven, well, before you get to the kingdom of heaven and you get to the person of the Lord and the account of his crucifixion and resurrection, well, you need to prove that there is a God. So that's why apologetics is a discipline that precedes evangelism. Um, to give you another example, you want to build a nice high rise in the heart of believers. So you need to excavate and lay the foundation. So you start excavating, and which is evangelism. But after you start excavating, you find that the soil is unfit. It has a lot of rocks. It has a lot of uh, maybe unsuitable ground. So this is apologetics. So what you do is you bring the, ex the big excavators to, which is apologetics, to remove the rocks to facilitate your building and laying the foundation. As Lee Strobel's, uh, Lee Strobel once said, he said, uh, Lee Strobel is the, is the author for The Case for Christ. He said, evangelism in this day and age is spelled apologetics, right? And we'll go into this a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper. Okay, so here, 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 is, here comes the part that we're going to talk a little bit, uh, a little bit more in detail. So, do we need ap apologetics, and why do we need apologetics? The main reason why we need apologetics is humanity is in crisis. The society, the culture is in crisis. Our fallen humanity and our very fabric of society is in crisis. Let's take a quick synopsis for us to get the idea. Moral decline. Our society is, um, is declining significantly morally. And there's a lot of people that call it moral decay. Um, let me give you just a few examples. The first movie that had a profanity uttered in it was in 1940s, which was Gone with the Wind, right? So that's 19, call it the 40s. So that's 60 or 70, 65 years, call it on average. Look at how we have declined or society has declined in a way that you cannot find 
a movie script that is clean, that does not have a profanity. And forgive me for saying that, but movies are now a garbage of profanity and sexuality and violence. This, those are the three criteria that basically will form the plot of a movie that we're watching. Look at music. Good luck finding a music or a song that does not have explicit profanity and that does not promote living an immoral life. It is, it is unbelievable when you, when you think about it that those are the things that we are listening and hearing. Pornography. Pornography is something that, that maybe back, back in the days um, was, we used to see it in, in, in late teenagers. Now we see pornography in 10 and 11 year olds. And by the way, pornography is one of the wealthiest industries in, uh, in North America. Everything basically that is written in Romans 1 is happening right now. So this is a moral decline. A complete eradication of God. Look at the coordinated planned effort to evict our Lord God from the very fabric of society again. In the US, the, the education system was founded on Christian education. And it, it was basically to teach Christian um, faith. And then it got broadened to start teaching English and other subjects. Look at where we are now. In the 60s, public, in public schools, prayer was banned. And a few years later, you cannot see a religious symbol or a cross in, in a public school. Now, evolution is not just a theory. It is a taught, a scientific fact that is being taught in schools. Look at the workplace. You can be fired for speaking openly about your faith. Friedrich Nietzsche, who is a philosopher in, in the 1800s, he's the one who popularized the notion of God is dead. God has bled to death. He said that God has bled to death and he predicted two things that, that were going to happen in the 20th century. The moral decline of society, which we talked about, and we see it clearly, and the violence and hatred would be rampant in the 20th century. Violence and hatred. Nietzsche was on point. The violence and hatred in the 20th century surpassed anything in history. We became more hateful and more violent in face in the face of morality. So when you, when you look at it, humanity in the 20th century has committed more immoral crimes and death more than the previous 19 centuries combined. Humanity never hit a lower point in hatred and violence like this. Look at the courts of law. People who are supposedly a family and, and related of blood, whether siblings, parents, children, they're suing each other. And hatred has basically infiltrated everything. There is more domestic violence than ever before. And the list goes on and on and on. Humanity is playing God. This is, this is one that really, that really gives me um, goosebumps. Look back at Genesis 3, the fall of humanity. So here is Eve looking at the tree of good, the knowledge of good and evil. And she starts a conversation with the devil. And she says, God told us that the moment we're going to eat from this tree, we're going to die. What did the devil say? The devil told her, you will not surely die. For God knows that the moment you eat of this tree, your eyes will be opened. And what will happen? You will become like God. This is exactly what humanity is doing now, the days. 
humanity. The creature is, is defying the creator, is playing God. Humanity wants to decide who lives and who dies, like an abortion, euthanasia, medically assisted dying. Humanity is trying to alter the way they are created, transgenderism. Even the way God created you, humanity is defying, I don't want to be what God created me, I want to be something else. God said, who can add a cubit to their strat stature? And here is humanity defying God and changing the way they look, the way they talk, the way they want to be addressed. Humanity is playing God. Humanity is trying to rise, or the creature is trying to rise above the creator. Marketplace of ideologies. Our society or our culture became a marketplace, like a big mall with many shops of ideologies. Pick what you like. Another dominant trait in our society is that it became a marketplace of ideologies. That's what St. Paul spoke about, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, the powers, and the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness. This is what we're dealing with. The enemy, my beloved, is secular idea, ideologies. You know, unfortunately in the West, the, 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 the enemy is like poison. It's, 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 uh, it's hidden in a candy or, or, or in a nice meal that you don't realize until you start digesting it. Look at all the isms out there. Atheism, human, humanism, existentialism, secularism, hedonism, pantheism, new atheism, liberalism, all those are ideologies, relativism, and so on and so forth. Those are ideologies that the devil, his idea behind it is to obscure and make the truth as ambiguous as possible. To the point that this is the trait of postmodernism. Modernism is that there is no truth, or postmodernism is that there is no truth. What is the devil trying to do here? He's trying to completely blind us of ultimate truth or absolute truth. And then he gives you a marketplace of ideologies. What are you? Are, are you a scientist? Well, I have this ideology about scientism. Go for it. Are you a man who wants to pursue pleasure? There is hedonism, go for it, and so on and so forth. So this is just to give you an idea. So what does all this have to do with apologetics? Everything. Living in an era of information and in an era of technology and ideologies, the war has never been fiercer on the mind, has never been fiercer on the intellect. And we are bombarded, and our, and our youth and our children are bombarded with ideologies. So we are in the greatest need of apologetics, weeding out the wrong ideologies, clarifying the picture in front of our youth, telling them that there is truth, and it's as clear as the sun, and remove the blindness from the faith, and to grow in the faith with reason. What is the biblical mandate? This is, this is one of, I, I love this, because the Bible couldn't have been clearer about the mandate for us to be completely strong about our faith and to give a defense. This is the most famous one, 1 Peter 3.15, which is sanctify the Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense, an apologia, to everyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you, in meekness and fear. So a defense, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. Contend, if you look at the, the, the definition of contend, it's almost to become, يعني, uh, in an intellectual way, to almost يعني, struggle, contend earnestly for the faith, which has been 
once delivered to the saints. Holding fast the faithful word as has been taught, that has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. To exhort and convict those who contradict. And in 2 Corinthians 10, it says, St. Paul says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. This is what we explained, that the creature is rising above the creator. And St. Paul, 2,000 years ago, is telling us, make sure you cast down all arguments and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. Put this together, a defense, contend, earnestly, exhort, convict, cast down arguments. It is apologetics. So finally, how do we, what, what is the art of doing apologetics? So basically, know your faith, know your enemy, know your audience, and speak the truth in love. So this is basically the art. Know your faith as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. So walk in him rooted and built up and established in the faith. Rooted and built up. How much are we in need nowadays? We are like the reed shaken by the wind. We do not know what we believe and we do not know why we believe what we believe. And the first thing that St. Peter says in, in 1 Peter 3.15, he says, sanctify the Lord God or the Lord Christ in your hearts. When, once you do this, then you're always going to be ready to give a defense. So the first point is, how are you going to defend a faith that you do not live and you do not know? So the first point is to know your faith. Know the enemy. We said the enemy is not the person that sit, that's sitting across the table from you or that is debating with you or that is um, argumenting with you or is uh, providing arguments. The enemy is the ideology that has infiltrated the society. Know the audience. Behind every question, there is a questioner. And I want to I wanna maybe spend a minute on this because... One of the biggest criticisms and the biggest pitfalls of um, apologetics is to think that you are a winner of argument. You know, you're getting busy putting together arguments uh, to shaft the other person and, and, win, and win him over and what you're doing. And what happens is that you often win the argument, but you lose the person and you lose sight of the person behind the question. Remember that you're trying to win the person, not the argument. You know, and, and another pitfall of, of apologetics uh, or a common criticism is that we always think that the fundamental problem with the person or in the mind of the question is purely intellectual. And if I just appease the mind and the intellect, I should automatically win the person. But oftentimes, the question will have an intellectual appearance to it. And, but behind it, there is a connection to the heart and the struggles of the questioner that is posing the question. So we ought to understand the heart of the questioner, not just look at the question um, in isolation. And then speaking the truth in love. St. Peter says, after he says, Make sure you provide an answer to everyone who asks you for the hope that is, or the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And then in 2 Timothy, it says, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. And, and St. Jude says, and on some have compassion, making a distinction, like understand, this is the point of differentiating be between the question and the questioner. Have compassion on the questioner who's struggling in his life and the question that is being asked, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire or snatching them from the fire. Let your speech always be with grace, grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer one another. So put this together, 
meekness, gentle, patient, humility, compassion, saving others with grace seasoned with salt. This is apologetics. And if I, if I summarize this, I would say this is the task of Christian apologetics. It is to ultimately present the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and who he is. It is not in arguments. It's not in making sure that if I'm asked this question, then this is the answer. It's to present wholeheartedly Christ, the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, who has loved us to the end until death on the cross. And this is Christian apologetics. And glory be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much, Good Sabuna. Um, we miss uh, we miss those words very much uh, nowadays. And I uh, thank you. And I think Otsak, uh, your reverence, gonna be with us also next week, continuing this, right? Sure, Abuna. Mustahil, Abuna, but very good. I think it, we might even maybe need another uh, couple of uh, weeks <laughs> if we can be. Uh, greedy and and take of of your reverence time but we'll leave it up to your reverence um uh evaluation maybe if we need one or two more um but let's see uh the questions that we have i really liked very much abuna that um the second last slide i i felt is just talking and saying just be a christian mm. <laughs> mm. just be meek you know gentle uh seasoned with salt yeah with grace with love just being a christian correct uh but this is just my simple maybe i'm just uh, oversimplifying it um but uh, i would like to hear from everyone here please guys uh unmute yourself jump in it would we have a very nice small group i think we're all um very uh um familiar with each other We'll be okay just to jump in. Amir, excellent timing. Uh, 